uh, thanks to all of you for coming and welcome to the Bard Graduate Center. Um, we are only in spirit on West 86th Street these days, but uh, in spirit also, uh, and in that spirit, I want to acknowledge that the Bard Graduate Center on West 86th Street on the island of Manhattan or Manahata uh, lives its life on the ancient and modern homeland of the Lenny Lenape people, Lenape Hoking. Uh, uh, and this land that we are on is also and remains a home for many indigenous peoples uh, and travelers from all over. Uh, our speaker today, uh, Professor Cherry uh, Quizon, um, is going to talk to us about textiles from the Philippines. Uh, her undergraduate work was uh, in art history and then anthropology, uh, and her PhD is from uh, the State uh, University. Uh, at uh, at uh, State University at Stony Brook. Uh, her dissertation was on the dress uh, and um, uh, ethnic identity of the Bagobo people in the Philippines. And uh, she was telling me just uh, before we started about how she came to her topic. And it's, uh, it's one of those stories that all of us uh, believe is true, but one rarely hears, um, and it's an important one. I mean, it's the it's the serendipity of research, walking in the hallways of uh, the Smithsonian Museum of Natural History with uh, a senior colleague who says, here's the key, open the cabinet, see what you find, and lo and behold, out pops a dissertation topic. Uh, not exactly like that, but it was the opportunity to discover in a cupboard uh, a hoard of material collected I hope I'm not stealing anything from your talk, uh, collected 100 years ago by two uh, sisters from Worcester, Massachusetts, visiting in St. Louis for the World's Fair in 1904, encountering the Bagobo people on display as people were put in those World's Fairs back then, uh, falling in fascination with them and then going to the Philippines the next year and coming back with this trove of material, which uh, Professor Kizan has published extensively um, uh, co-editing an influential volume on the World's Fair in 1904, um, contributing uh, a piece on uh, indigenous interlocutors to uh, Marla Burns' uh, volume on uh, weavers' stories, publishing on weaving and ethnography and translation uh, in visual anthropology review in 2019, publishing on the color purple uh, and indigenous weavers and cloth, and in press right now, Botanical Knowledge and Indigenous Textiles in the Southern Mindanao Highlands, Method and Synthesis Using Ethnography and Ethnobotany uh, to be published in Southeast Asia Research. So I think we have a treat ahead of us and it's my pleasure to turn over the microphone and the screen to Professor Kizan. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, um, Peter. Um, and I will start to share my screen. <clears throat> Um, and I hope that it's visible. Um, all right, so uh, thank you so much for having me as a visiting fellow at Bard uh, Graduate Center. Uh, I'm on my sabbatical year, so I thank my colleagues uh, at the Department of Sociology, Anthropology, Social Work, um, and Criminal Justice uh, in Seton Hall University for giving me a year to not teach um, during this uh, very challenging time for all scholars, right? And so, um, so today I'm gonna try to talk about a little portion of my larger topic, but I thank so much Peter for giving that segue because I'm not actually gonna be talking about uh, the Metcalf sisters in the World's Fair, but you see here on the left, um, an image from their collection. Um, and you see the inked number that they actually wrote on them. Uh, uh, this is the, the collection that's in the Smithsonian, but there's a partner collection that's also at the University of Pennsylvania, a museum. But I bring it up there as an image because um, what I'm really gonna be talking about today out of the larger kind of body of my work that I've been doing and thinking about, right, for more than 20 years, um, is this specific topic of what, what how do we think about textiles when the e-cut pattern, which you see here on the left, right, is a resist technique that many of you would know about, um, meets this fiber that is actually not cotton. When we think about Southeast Asia, most of the time, um, the, the textiles are actually of cotton. 
um, in most cases. And so the ECATs that you will see today would be ECATs from my uh, field research as well as from my museum research that come from Mindanao in the Southern Philippines. And they would visually appear to be very similar indeed to Eastern Indonesia, um, you know, the, the textiles in Flores and Sumbawa. But today I will actually be talking about a different set of comparative material which don't look similar to them. So it's actually kind of counterintuitive in terms of visual appearance, right? Uh, but instead I wanna talk about the fiber because using banana as a fiber, um, I believe changes, right? Uh, certain things about the chemistry of coloring um, the, 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 the thread itself and changes all kinds of things. Um, I gave a talk last week about just the color red, right? And Morinda and what that means in terms of the phenomenology of you know the preciousness of a, a color right so so it's a that's a whole different discussion but for today i want to talk about you know thread um, and pattern so thread being the banana fiber and uh pattern i i ar arrive at this because of the the seminar the the bgc's um, spring topic right how do we know and so my response to that was it just so happens that this past couple of years I've been look, thinking about the thingness of things, right? So let, let me look at, you know, things themselves. So thread versus pat and pattern, which is banana fiber and e -cut. And the insights that, that I bring from the field is that in my <clears throat> interactions with um, the weavers, not limited to the Vagobo, I also interacted with weavers of neighboring groups, as well as groups that are a little bit farther away, who all engage in banana and e -cut, right? So it's not just limited to Vagobo. Whenever I would try to talk to them about motifs, they were not interested. They would basically look bored, but instead they wanted to talk about numbers, which meant the number of ikat bundle counts, right? So they would get excited about 100s and say, but there's a, that's a 30, that's a 10. So it was like, it was very interesting for me. They wouldn't want to talk about colors, but they want to talk about plants. So the plants that made the color red or black. So it was very interesting. And then, <clears throat> I discovered also once I went into the field that um, language is not a very good way of defining the Bagobo as a group itself, but self-inscription. And I'll get into that quite a bit um, in this talk. Right? So, so these kind of insights from the fields, I now bring into this kind of very specific query into ikat and banana. So I believe that this has some kind of um, potential application for cultural historians, right? Um, Prehistory, longer history, historic ethno history, right? Uh, the co impact of COVID um, has meant that by now I should have had more information to share with you, but I don't. So all I have is existing data and perhaps some new research networks that I um, um, ended up developing because we're all kind of stuck at home and just doing everything by email and um, by Zoom and Viber and what have you, right? So, so the piece that I have here is a detail <clears throat> of uh, what's called the mother piece, an ime, uh, in the Vagobo textile um, universe, I say textile repertoire. Uh, and it's warp ikat as all of Mindanao's um, textiles are. And the particular banana species used all over the Philippines, not limited to it, but the ones that I'll talk about today is Musa textilis. And this was collected from 1906 to 1910 um, by the Metcalf sisters. So the purpose of the talk, would be um, just to introduce a topic because I imagine that many of you are not familiar um, with um, Southeast Asia or perhaps um, not um, Mindanao and the Southern Philippines and the Bago, but, but, the, but the literature that I draw from generally always would be Southeast Asian indigenous textiles, right? And my focus would be material culture that's organized around the making and use of cloth, right? Um, and the method that I use, so the data I share, the data I draw on would really be derived from ethnography. Um, as I'm trained as an anthropologist, um, museum collections research, and of course, generally because I'm doing the Okinawan stuff also as a case study. Um, so my primary information comes from the Bagobo. And uh, hopefully the idea is to perhaps contribute to uh, larger theoretical discussions or hypothesis testing or thinking about the relationship between language and material culture, which is of interest, not just to anthropologists, I believe, but it's interest of interest to a lot of people who are working with material culture. Um, to think about the textiles as a textile record, not just um, archives, but actually 
um, artifacts that can help us, um, that we can actually ask questions of, right, and get answers from. And um, perhaps th this is certainly informed by the broader discussion of Austronesian dispersals um, in uh, the out of China, out of Taiwan hypotheses, right, which I won't get into today, but, but, it, but it has some kind of implications there because of the language component as well as the material culture component. So the data that I'm going to look at would be specific to just cloth making, literally, right, the unspun fiber and the ikat, and um, how it becomes a problematic thing when we think about group style in Mindanao. So group style is one of these ideas that tend to persist. I mean, we have to say that there is a group and there is a style, but, but for today, I want to kind of ironically use the, the notion of a group to essentially critique the notion of a group, right? So if, if that kind of makes sense. So the case study or the, I'm looking at Okinawan, Okinawan people of the Rukyu Islands of, of Japan because of their use also of banana and ika. So, so this is important to, to kind of uh, state here that um, it's the ika portion that leads me to Okinawa because banana as a fiber is used very, very widely all over the, in many parts of the Pacific um, as well as uh, parts of, of Indonesia, right, um, parts of Taiwan, but, but specifically, right, the ikat portion is what brings me um, to Okinawa. So I'm revisiting something I wrote in 2011, so I thank uh, Petty Benitez Johano, who invited me to contribute to that volume on Austronesian, the Austronesian hypothesis, essentially, in museum collections um, in Indonesia, the Philippines, as well as um, um, in Europe, right, specifically Leiden. Um, and for the Okinawan material, I really rely, I have not been to Japan, that was kind of one of those things that you hope to do, but you couldn't, right? Uh, but I rely on the work of, of many people, um, most, uh, and I mentioned here just a few, uh, uh, the work of Hendricks, uh, Amanda Mayer, Stenshikum, um, Roy Hamilton, who had this volume on um, um, fast fiber and, and leaf fiber and alternative fibers, right, as well as tomita and tomita in court. So uh, the talk will kind of flow this way. Um, so I'm going to look at the distribution of banana cloth and ikat, right, those two things. Uh, talk a little bit about my methodologies and my data sources. Then I'll talk about the banana species that are uh, specific to these two places, right, the tex textiles and Baldiciana. Then I'll show you some images of banana loom woven um, cloth. So, so loom woven is important because there's lots of textiles that are not on the loom. These are used on the loom. I won't get to talk about looms. Some loom, uh, most of the Philippine material I show you would be using backstrap looms. Um, the Okinawan material, there's been use also of both backstrap as well as floor looms, right? But for sure they're on looms and not uh, woven without looms as well as garments. Then I'm going to talk about language, right? So this is a very big part of, of the, the kind of, I guess, the questioning of what a group identity means, uh, which is something that one can get from doing any kind of field research, and then some research directions. <clears throat> okay, so uh, I, I have here a map of, of Southeast Asia, and you see that they're all labeled right by, by, by country, right? So here is the Philippines. Uh, um, and um, here is uh, Taiwan, right? Indonesia is down here. Uh, and uh, it's not very visible, but, but the, the my Caroline Islands, right, are, are over here, right? Um, so I wanted to show you where Mindanao is, right? So that is Mindanao, it's the southern part of the Philippines. So it's very, very close, right, to the um, Sulawesi and the Halmahera Islands, right, of Indonesia, also very close to Borneo and Kalimantan. So the, all of, I looked at the museum um, collections, right, colonial collections, they were uh, late 19th, therefore Spanish period, and then early 20th century, therefore American period, right, that are in US and Europe. I've been doing this since 1992. Um, I'm not exhaustive, so I can't talk about every collection, but I focus on the ones that are well provenanced. And ethnographic research would be um, in uh, among the Bagobo, right, in that segment, right, um, of the map. And so um, the sampling frame, as I've mentioned, also was implemented in Mindanao. I wanted to understand Bagobo textiles, but I wanted to see who else was do doing, right, uh, Ikat, right, and Bagobo, uh, Ikat and Abaka. 
so it was a, a sampling frame that went outside of just the Bagobo group itself. So I did work among the Mandaya, among the Blaan, among the Tboli, uh, in terms of comparative um, research. Right? And um, it would suggest too that there's some archeological evidence that shows that there might have been a broader distribution of Abaka and Ikat, or at least um, unspun fiber and Ikat um, based on a 14th century archeological burial cloth, um, or at least a cloth associated with burial finds right in the mid central Philippines that are dated um, relatively to the 14th century, perhaps earlier. So it's a whole Musa and Ikat thing. And now outside of the Philippines, it would be uh, the Ryukyu Islands, right, of Southern Japan. And that's where we have the other um, Musa and Ikat traditions. Um, so what I cannot cover here would be the use of banana fiber that is not patterned by Ikat, but patterned in a different technique, which is supplementary weft. So for example, the work of Petra Martin, um, um, in Sangihe uh, Talaud Islands in, uh, in Indonesia, as well as the work um, of, of Donald Rubinstein in the Carolines, right? I cannot cover here. So, um, all right, so there are two species uh, of banana. And so on the left, I have a map. I got this from just an online resource, lots of wonderful online resources nowadays, but this is the Kew Gardens, Royal Botanical Gardens. And they show here on the map um, their mapping of native species and where it's been introduced. So it's a very, um, it's a very conservative mapping. So they only put in um, that it's an accepted uh, whatever introduction based on right certain parameters. So, so some of you might find maps that might have right a broader number of introduced, but I'm using the Q here. So their Philippines is right here and it shows where it might it has been introduced um, over time, but we do know that they're in more places than that. And on the uh, right, we have a map of the banana species that is used in Okinawa, um, the Ryukyu Islands in Japan, which is Musa Bobisiana. And so we see that um, it's, it has a wider right, um, a dispersal of being native and it's been introduced according to Q, right, in, to Taiwan, um, example, and Borneo Kalimantan, right, and, um, Peninsular Malaysia, for example. But what I'm also providing here would be uh, what I think is important would be local names, right? So when we speak of, of Abaka, I use the kind of like the Philippine name for it. It's used from all over the Philippines and it's what I'll be using moving forward. However, for the Tagabao Bagobo who I work with, they call it Buo, which I'm not gonna use, but I will just be using Abaka. There are many, many common names. It's a very historically present fiber, right? Manila hemp, Kanyamo de Manila, Pazer banana, Chandro de Manila, right? And Lutai and Cebuano, for example. Um, and in the Okinawan um, side, uh, it would be Ito Basho, right? Uh, which would be uh, Ito fiber, right? Of Basho, Yayama, in Okinawa Island, Japan. Uh, but it's also known as Basha, right? Uh, by, by uh, Okinawan peoples. Itobasha is also kind of like the Japanese usage as opposed to Okinawan usage. So there's a lot of that going on. So it's important just to be mindful as we move forward when we do these types of studies, just to kind of note all of the synonyms and just note where they come from so that it will help not get confused as we move forward. Um, so here are some visuals, right, of, of some examples of these banana cloth. So on the left, uh, this is from the uh, Museum of Natural History, uh, the collection of Laura Watson Benedict. Laura Watson Benedict is, is another wonderful story on her own. Um, she, uh, the, the work I published in the Metcalf Sisters includes a discussion of Laura Watson Benedict as well as um, uh, Faye Cooper Cole, who has a collection for the Field Museum. Um, but uh, uh, her uh, material is, is very special in, in, very, in very specific ways. But I show you um, a collection of trouser cloths that are just folded up, right? So you can, there are stripes, right? And you can see that using all of these materials, the Bagobo like to have this heathered kind of native bird kind of look, right? That they're trying to achieve in these stripes. And on the right, um, one of my early examples and my only examples right now of Basho Flu uh, is from the Museum of Fine Arts Boston, the Weber collection um, from the 20th century. So the term for banana fiber woven cloth um, for Tagabao Bagobo is inabal. And the term for uh, banana fiber cloth uh, in Okinawa is bashofu, right? Um, which means basho cloth, right? And so so um, 
initially I put banana cloth, but I believe it has something to do also with the Bash, Basho Islands. And so I kind of deferred to my colleagues who specialize in Japan to tell me more um, about that. Um, so the, the, these details of textiles are actually parts of garments, right? So uh, this whole other discussion about the distinction between flat cloth and garments, right? So I'm leaving here with garments. So here you have uh, the trousers that have these very, um, very ornate kind of appliques um, on the left, also from the Benedict collection, right? And here on the right, you have like the view from uh, um, uh, when I was studying it uh, at the MFA um, of, of a garment, right? So it's a basho full garment um, in its entirety. Um, but we also are talking about ikat, right? So here um, I have, I tried to find images that were not from museums, but from the field, right? So on the left is an image I took um, in uh, my field work in 1993. Um, and I wanted to show you that the, the earlier shot uh, of the Metcalf piece in the Smithsonian has the same motif here, which is like, uh, um, I was told it was daupola, which would be the leaves of the palm from which they take the lumber for the looms, right? Um, that you have the fringe motif here and then a, a portion of a crocodile. So this is like the black and white warp ikat that you find also a mother piece. And on the right, it's a, a image taken by Amanda Mary Stinchikum, um in Kijoka in uh, Northern Okinawa Island um, from the book that, that uh, Hamilton and Milgram published in 2007. So the term for the cloth, any cloth, not necessarily patterned by ikat, is just inabal or bashofu. But if they are actually patterned, then the bagobo would call theirs binodbod or binodbud. That's how they pronounce it. But I, you know, uh, I just use binodbod as a way of spelling it. And kasuri, right? Um, so these are kind of well-known terms um, that refer to ikat and cloth. Okay. So. I can't go into this, but a very big exciting part of this is the fact that these types of cloth are make use of thread that is not twisted, it's unspun there. So hence, from an archaeological perspective, one does not need the presence of a spindle to infer the presence or absence of cloth. So it's got that kind of interesting ramifications, right? And so the work of Judith Cameron um, and her work with textiles, including in Vietnam, as well as um, elsewhere, right, is, is important in this. Um, and so the kind of research that we do actually can be of use to many others who are pursuing right, these types of more um, technical questions that could be um, extended back over time, even right, uh, quite a while back. So um, this is uh, information from, um, that comes from uh, um, the work of uh, Katrin Hendrick and um, <clears throat> Amanda Mayer Stinchikum, right? Uh, and it shows, uh, one of my most favorite images that I've seen uh, in, in the, the book, uh, that, that it was, it was Amanda's, right? Um, and it shows you right today um, how um, uh, you would see uh, kasuri cloth, right? So um, the topics that are covered in the studies of it in Hendrix include the history of the Ryukyu kingdom and the sumptuary rules uh, concerning white right, commoners and people who are uh, aristocrats, right? As well as the notion of right, regional identity and this resurgence today for the region as they are now part of, of uh, the nation state, right, Japan. Um, as well as um, the, the notion of, of you know, uh, it's like an art, the Minge movement, right? Uh, the arts and craft movement that looked upon, right? The people of the Southern islands, right? As, as, a, as a kind of um, um, authentic other, right? Uh, which which Amanda, Amanda Mayer Stinchikum ex, uh, explores uh, very well in, in her article. Um, and uh, in this case, she actually makes even distinctions between the textiles made in Southern Rukyu, Yayama, as opposed to Northern Okinawan, right? Rukyu, which would be Okinawan Islands. So very interesting distinctions there, where in uh, the Northern uh, uh, parts of the islands um, have a more, um, Tokyo and Japan centric kind of production, right? Uh, as opposed to uh, the others that might be more of within community um, production. So the photograph here, um, I quote from the caption, um, it's a perception of tradition, quote unquote, desired for the festival um, that they were having um, in um, uh, Takatomi Island. Oh, but what was interesting is that the, you can see the juxtaposition, right? Of everyday street dress, right? Of uh, um, um, 
of Nemo, Nemo Tohatsu, right, um, in the same um, frame. But here are the uh, Kasuri cloths, right, with the with ikat um, um, that's that's in there, right, uh, contrasted in there. Um, and so similarly, for I wanted you to see pagobo garments, right. And they, I wanted to also be able to give you some, in this case, a, a kind of a time de depth, right? So you have on the left uh, oh, a wonderful portrait uh, by the Gerhard sisters uh, of Tubagobo men who were at the World's Fair. Um, I thank R.J. Fernandez uh, for um, alerting me to this um, to this image, to this photograph, um, and. Um, you see that on the right, this is a photograph of my field work, uh, Gyawan and Apabato, the late Gyawan and Apabato, who were posing, they were, they basically, I, I, they were asked to, I asked them to put on kind of, you know, th their, their ceremony the dress and they decided, yeah, let's do it here by, by the altar post. Um, and so these two with the time span, right, of right, uh, 90 years, um, shows the, the stability, right, of, of, of the look, right, uh, of how the dress is conceived and designed. Um, so Bagobo dress is called Umpak Bagobo, right? And, but on the right-hand side, what I wanted to point out to you is that um, the lower garments are made of banana <clears throat> with ikat, right? And on the left, it's both, all of them are banana, upper and lower, except the upper garments, uh, this is men's cloth, tend to be checks, but the, if there is any ikat, it's on the it's on the um, trousers. And I also um, note that over time, um, there is a certain conservatism in change for lower garments as opposed to upper garments, which in this case is polyester, right? Um, so, so there's a, a more um, freedom, it seems, right, for upper garments um, and the material that they try to make use of um, for those. So that's kind of to show you how those look like um, today. So, I go now to the part that um, um, surprised me. I completely did not expect uh, when I started this uh, study, uh, when I did it for my dissertation, I went into the field and it completely uh, took me by surprise. So let me begin by talking about, I want to think about this as um, the notion of Bagobo self-ascription, right? So identity. So we think about material culture and identity. It's a very large topic, not limited for sure to textiles. Um, but in this particular case, I just want to kind of start by giving you like a timeline of when we can talk about a category of people called the Bagobo. I'm being very conservative here. I'm only focusing on what uh, has been established in named right uh, archives. So I would say 1880s in terms of when we have named reported populations and groups of people by folks who have actually been there. So I have this kind of high bar. It has to be people who've been there. Um, I don't really kind of take into consideration traveler accounts by folks who haven't actually traveled to the area, right, or secondhand accounts. So these are kind of like firsthand accounts. And I expect that this can actually be moved back um, in time once we find more archival collections, as well as actual textile collections. And I, I, I think that that will happen, and it's going to have to happen somewhere um, in Spain and perhaps in other parts of Europe, because there was a lot of travel um, that was going on. Uh, that was not uh, through government agents, shall we say, right? So, um, but we don't have that yet. So uh, Alexander Schadenberg was an amateur naturalist living in Manila whose weekend uh, uh, with his friend would go and collect um, bugs, I kid you not. <laughs> and so he talked about the time when they went to um, Sibulan, which is uh, one of the uh, Tagobo Bago areas uh, south of Mount Apo in Mindanao. And they basically collected um, insects, right? And the Bogobos were their suppliers, essentially. So it's, uh, he had a very, very good account of that. Uh, Mateo Gisbert was a Jesuit who wrote the, the Bogobo Dictionary, right, also in the 1880s. And then uh, Joseph Montano was a French traveler, natural historian, um, as well as uh, Joaquin Rajal uh, Lare, who um, was a Spanish official who went to climb Mount Apo, which is the highest mountain in the Philippines, which is smack in the middle of Bagobo um, territory, right? So they have these accounts. So they would refer to them, right, as, as Bagobo at that point in time. Then you have, again, museum collections that are labeled as such. So Schadenberg has some pieces um, in Leiden, I believe in Vienna as well, uh, that we think are connected right to, to his activities in Mindanao, but not limited to Mindanao. 
then there will be material from the 1900s uh, from the Louisiana purchase, purchase exhibition, which is now spread apart in various museums. It's a very complex question because some of the materials at the Louisiana Purchase Exposition uh, in the World's Fair were displayed in those infamous villages with living peoples, but most of the other materials were actually in a separate exhibition space where they were displayed as things, right? And then of course, the Benedict Collection in Natural History, the Faye Cooper Cole Collection Field Museum, and then the Metcalf Collection, right? So these are all the collections that I've kind of looked at um, in terms of, of, you know, and also the associated collection material, the letters, the lists and all that. And then in, uh, there's also new information, right, by, by others doing anthropological and historical field work um, on the Bogobos. So Arsenio Manuel, uh, late Kenneth Payne, right, Rodil, Hayase, Gloria, right. And then a, a, a significant amount of field-based linguistic research, right, um, such as by Elkins and Dubois, that have happened, especially post-war, post-World War II, and post, I guess, post-Philippine independence, right? And all around this time, too, there's a lot of activities by Bible translators, right, the uh, SI, uh, Summer Institute of Linguistics, and a lot of kind of morphing in Philippine government agencies that deal with indigenous peoples, such as the Commission of National Integration that the later on Panamint around the Marcus era. So a lot of things were happening. So all we know is that by the 1960s, this much we know, what has emerged is that there seems to be a tripartite identity, wherein the Bagobo now have subgroups. <laughs> okay. And so when I commenced field work in 1990, um, we know that the Bagobo, of course, existed because they are, you know, a, a, a very viable and very rare present people, right, um, in Mindanao. It wasn't, it just wasn't clear at the time of my research whether or not there was any weaving still going on, right, and what kind of textiles were being made. But by my field work, for sure, it was a hyphenated identity. So it was Baga, a Tagabawa, Bagobo. So it's Bagobo, it's, it's this hyphen, right? Tagabawa, Bagobo, Jangan, Bobo, Bagobo, Obo, Bagobo. So when I entered the field, I really did not know. Um, I knew I had to learn a field language. I was going to learn it in the field itself. But what I discovered was that I had to pick because they were so completely different from each other, right? So I chose Tagabawa. And part of the reason why is because um, a majority of the material that you see here on the screen is actually Tagabawa. So the first bullet, all of that, Schadenberg, Hispert, Montano, Rahal, that's Tagabawa. The Bagobo Museum Collection, Schadenberg, Benedict Cole, Metcalf, that's all Tagabawa. And then for that new anthropological research, then you have a mix, right, of, of other groups, the, the Jangan and the Obo, right, um, as well as Tagabawa itself, right. So, so it, it was a very interesting thing. So I had to choose Tagabawa to learn, I right, guess, as a field language. Um, and, you know, learning as a field language is never, ever going to be enough. It's never going to be fabulous, but it allows you to have some kind of insight into a number of things. And one of the things that it has taught me is that the difficulty, right, or the, the real linguistic distance between these three. If I could, I could perhaps cross over to a ball, but even then a is very different. Um, in the field, people will tell me, okay, I know Tagabawa, I also know Obo. In Tagabawa, they would call that mythological, you know, person tuwaang, but in Obo it would be tulalang. You get these kinds of things um, that people tell you. So it's a real linguistic difference, right? However, these three groups do refer to themselves, right, as, as Bagobo. So, it's, so therefore, Bagobo is not a linguistic identity. So when we say ethno-linguistic groups, it might not apply. It does not apply um, to the Bagobo. They do have a shared textile material culture, right? So this is what's interesting. They do share, right, this, this body of, 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 of a material assemblage, right, that signals, right, who they are, um, but not language. Uh, so, so that was one of the things that that I believe is actually more common than we think that is happening, right? That that was not going to be visible uh, to us until we kind of start asking, well, what about this and what about that, right? So, so we have this kind of situation where there is this kind of identity category, a self-ascription, right? But it's not linguistic. Um, but it might be more of a contiguous territory, right? Which, which is another research um, altogether. So um, this, this slide is going to be a little busy, so forgive me for that, but I'm trying to kind of explain certain things uh, about um, language. I'm not a linguist, uh, but, but uh, you know, American four-field anthropology requires you to know a little bit about linguistics, right? 
So when I say that the three languages are actually different, um, the, this is what um, we can, I can do to kind of explain that. So let, let me begin with a map on the right. So the map on the right comes from an article um, by Elkins in 1974, where he talks about the Manobo language, right? So it's a, it's, a, it's a language classification. And you see all of these three letter um, uh, labels that refer to all these various languages that belong to the Mano Manobo subfamily, sub subfamily. And so the ones that are in yellow, that one is the Tagabawa and that one is the Obo. So we know that, that the two of the three Bagobo languages, right, are of the Manobo language family. So the little blue square uh, shows you the area that's um, being um, kind of blown up a little bit here on the left. And the map on the left comes from Shin Hayase's book in 2003, where he shows um, the areas that he studied, that he went to uh, in his effort to interview various uh, Bagobo of all those language groups, right? And it's not so easy to see because it's all, of course, just grayscale. But the Tagabawa Bagoba areas would be here, right? So this is the Davao Gulf, so this is the water. And this would be the Mount Apo, right? And, and Mount Aloma, so this is the mountain range. The Tagabawa Bagoba are around this area, right? And then the Obo Bagoba are on the other side of the mountain. And then you have the Jangana Plata here, right? So, um, the languages, of course, extend outside Davao city limits. Hayase's map limits itself to the Davao city limits, right? And what he calls Klata here, it's not very visible, but he calls it Klata. It's actually a synonym of Jangan. And Jangan is Bilik. So it's a different language group altogether. So here it's the Jangan here, right? Surrounded by, by Bagobo, uh, Manobo, Bagobo, Obo, Bagobo, um, Tagabawa. So, uh, which is very interesting. And so th the other way I could show this distinction, I guess, is I just took these screenshots from um, uh, Glottolog, which is a wonderful online resource um, on world languages. And I just wanted to show you that of the very large Austronesian language family, on the first uh, third of the screen on the left, you see Tagabawa here, and they belong to Manobo's central South Manobo group. The center of the screen, you see the Oboba Gobo there, and they belong to Manobo group also of, but this time of the West Manobo group. So these are kind of language branchings, right? Meanwhile, the Jangan are up here, a completely different, right, branch um, subfamily, the Bilik. Hence, I have people who I met in the field who are Jangan, but they also spoke Tagabawa. So they could talk to me in Tagabawa, but they didn't know Jangan. Uh, but they also, many of them spoke, I'm, I'm from Manila, uh, my mother is uh, Tagalog, my father is Kapampangan, so I also spoke Manila English, uh, Manila Tagalog, right, as well as English. So the, the field language in most cases, if they knew, uh, and many of them did speak Tagalog, but the ones that would not speak um, Tagalog, right, would say, oh, you know, Tagabawa, okay, let's do that, right, but the, most of them are multilingual. So, so it's very, very complex, right, on the ground, where you have this, this kind of linguistic kind of, um, well, the, the de facto um, um, heteroglossia, you might say, right? The, the de facto uh, multilingualism as a natural part of life, right? Um, for, for the Bagobo and most indigenous peoples. So, okay, so for me, I wanted to ask now, um, what are the research implications, right, of some of this, right? Looking at um, the body of museum, material as, as, a, as a resource, right, as, a, as, a, as an archive, right, as well as looking at um, research in the field and the kind of data that we can get when we're in the field. Um, and so, as well as um, what it means for us moving forward as if we pursue this kind of research. So, of course, provenance, I believe that members of the audience know all about provenance and the importance of provenance, right, uh, but provenance, um, it's important, but not in just the way by which discovering who collected what, but it's actually in this case, in terms of um, the ones that did collect it, did they buy it from a store? Did they buy it, right? Did they get it from um, the people that made it? So, so those are very important things in terms of assessing uh, provenance um, of, of material. Uh, and so I have images here from the Metcalf collection, right? That shows the original tags and then the Smithsonian's newer tags, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, the importance of defining a community polythetically. So we, I give the Bagobo case here, 
the Okinawan case is interesting, and I think it's it's unfolding as well because there is right this this resurgence of their own identity in relation to the center, right, perceived of as in in the capital or Japan itself or Japaneseness. Um, but then I think that will continue to evolve. But it's important when I say polythetically, right, that we need to kind of really disambiguate language from material culture, from territory, right, from genetics, right, from so so, so from 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 from. Uh, descent. So, so we just need to be very, very clear about those separate elements when we define a community. And then, of course, a critical engagement with institutional data. So I have here a map from the National Museum of the Philippines in 1974 that tries to kind of list all of the so-called ethno-linguistic groups of the Philippines. And you see there's quite a big uh, uh, diversity of peoples, but this is actually the case in any country of Southeast Asia, right? any country in many parts of the world actually right where the uh, that it's actually um linguistic diversity is not a desired thing it's just a reality that people just speak more than one language because they they do right uh, it's it's part of, of who you are in your way of life and so when that is represented institutionally there are all kinds of things that have to occur and so as researchers, we have to kind of accept that that exists, but we also have to have a critical distancing with the kinds of categories that are generated right, by, by institutions, not limited to national governments, but you know, even heritage institutions. So the second set of research implications would be, um, well, here comes the bananas, right? Uh, uh, there's a long view of human relations with the natural world. So, um, the genus I learned as I'm preparing for this talk, there's yet more new developments, right, in how we do plant DNA. So the, the plant DNA sections means that there's a new way of organizing plant varieties. So indeed, Musa textilis is separate from a different section, a, a chromosome section, um, as Musa Balbisiana, right? Um, in the course of doing this, I also uh, got to know some work by new researchers, um, such as uh, Celine Kerfant, who just uh, finished her dissertation on phytoliths um, uh, and the Bashik um, Islands, um, and how um, you know ethnoarchaeological methods, which is when she kind of goes and does research with people that make use of banana fiber today in Batanes, in the northern Philippines, in Lando Island, in Taiwan, right, produces all kinds of interesting new questions. And so the, there was an email and file exchange between Selena and myself, and when some questions came up, I reached out to colleagues who are worked in Batanes, Maria Mangas, as well as Ed. Valientes, who himself is Ivatan, right? So there's kind of the, all this interesting email exchange all arising because I asked Celine, oh, that term you used, was that the local term or was that a, a different term? So suddenly all these kinds of interesting questions arose, um, which I think is part of interdisciplinary research, right? Uh, because the kinds of questions I would ask as an ethnographer would be different from the kinds of questions, for example, that, that Celine will ask, right, as, as an archeologist. And then of course, this variety that she is, she's found on, on uh, in the Bashik, which is Musa in Salormonta, is is closer to Abaka. You got little geeky nerve uh, thing on the side, right? And the set of uh, research, I don't, I've made the numbering. It should be number three, okay? So uh, the third would just be um, uh, ethnographic and historical research. This is again, this is nothing new. This that we all kind of do. Um, in, in various ways in many dis disciplines, right? But I guess the, the importance, right, of, of ethnography as a method and a strategy. So it's, it's, a, it's a careful uh, kind of positioning of, of what's viewed from below, therefore not institutional necessarily. And even though we engage in heritage projects, it's important to understand that just because you're dealing with indigenous peoples that it's actually not a homogenous voice, right? very important to kind of keep that in mind because heritage narratives tends to kind of make everything a single voice, right? Um, which is part of the, right, I guess, part of the, the assumption of, of, uh, of, of many of these projects. And then of course, the possibility of hypothesis testing, right? Uh, so we can use the textile data as an archive, right? Um, that we can use for asking questions that can be used, right, in a elicitation in the field, but also can be used for us thinking about this cloth, this unspun cloth, right, um, that has this, right, distinct kinds of, of, of um, uh, variations in different parts um, of the world, depending on how humans use them. And uh, this not, never happened. I hope to do some more non-descriptive techniques, right, like reflectance and morphology. 
um, which is why I joined BGC. Right? So I'm hoping to have those kinds of conversations um, in the future. But these are just kind of the ways by which we could use existing material that's already there, right? In a different kind of way, um, um, not necessarily just uh, to use them to ask questions in the field, but to actually make use of them for, you know, larger kind of uh, hypo hypothesis testing, right? And all that. So. I'm going to stop it right here. I think I spoke for more than half an hour and I'm going to stop my screen and turn it over to you, Peter. Thank you very much. Uh, that was great. Um, really exciting. Uh, we're going to take some questions. I'm going to start off with, with just the first question, uh, which reflects my own interest and ignorance uh, one at the same time. Kind of, I loved the way you broke it down at the end, the different kinds of questions that you're asking. I'd like to ask a question that kind of comes athwart all of those. And just to get a sense of you based on your experience, um, how have you found material culture as a marker for some of these complicated questions? Do you find that it, it um, for instance, maps one-to-one -one on linguistic difference? Does it complicate linguistic difference by providing a common uh, focus for people from different linguistic communities, different geographical communities. How does overall, would you say, material culture in the case of, of Mindanao, um, and maybe you want to generalize from it through Southeast Asia or not, how does it relate to these other, let's say, um, splitting or discriminating research approaches? Um, I think if I ended up doing work, let's say, on not textiles, if I did work, for example, the other alternative was to do work on wooden um, mortuary figures, right, in wood sculpture in northern Luzon, right, it would be so different because textiles as a material culture, right, is, is actually, uh, specifically in the kind of stuff I'm looking on, is on the body. So, so the nature of the material culture that, that I believe one is studying kind of dictates the sort of questions that you can ask of it, right? And so when, because it's clothing the body um, and because today it's mostly ceremonial, but it still had that ceremonial purpose, right? Um, it then, in that sense, I would say that the material is subsidiary to the ideology, right? So the ideology of the group, right? So this is how we are, this is how we appear, that is why we are the same. So in this particular case, it's subsidiary to ideology. So the ideology kind of defines it. So it's, I, I was at the talk by, by Michael Chazen, right? He talks about the status of an artifact, right? And it's only the relationship of, of two people. So in that case for textiles, um, when I'm thinking about identity, uh, it, it, it's that way. So, so even if you say, well, how come you don't speak the same language, but you're still part of the group? For me as a Southeast Asian person, specialist, right, as well as, you know, someone coming from the Philippines, it's not so difficult to understand that someone can actually have multiple linguistic kind of yeah, uh, identities, as well as still have more than one group identity. Uh, but for somebody that, for example, my husband is from Greece, he still cannot, we have been discussing this forever and ever, he still doesn't understand how it's possible to have so many languages, right? And to say that you want it. So, so he still is a skeptic of this topic of mine, right? Because how can you have three, right? Because for him, it's like this whole idea of nation, right? And language and identity, it's like, like uh, the notion of nationalism itself. So yes, if it were a different set of materials with a different kind of material culture engagements, it would be different, right? So, so I can only speak to this one, right? Um, if it were, for example, so, so I'm talking about garments. There's also a class of textiles that are not worn. They're just put on display, almost like paintings. Then I think that would be a little different, right? Um, because it would be like a public as opposed to a personal material. Um, I have colleagues who are working on ceramics, right? So, so it's a, so, so yes, so that's, I guess, the, the challenge, right, for, for material culture. So, um, and then it's a matter of like, you know, what, what particular narrative, because there are always multiple narratives, right? Well, what particular narrative are we going, to, we privilege maybe if, if you're going to represent it in an exhibition, for example, right? Um, or perhaps what kinds of questions should we ask, right? 
of, of the material. So, so that's, I hope that answers your question. That, that was a great answer. Yeah, thank you very much. Freya. Thank you, that was really fascinating. And I have a question that I think in some way um, uh, piggybacks on Peter's question and may sound really idiotic. So I'll preface it that way. Um, but I'm somebody, I'm a design historian and I'm somebody who thinks about things and thingness quite a bit. And it caught my attention in the beginning of your talk when you mentioned those ideas. And I'm wondering how you feel um, language and thingness act upon each other, or do you feel that they do? Do you feel that thingness is affected by language or are they sort of separate categories? Oh, it's definitely affected by language, except that um, I guess it kind of goes back to John Berger and right seeing and, you know, we're taught the way we are taught to see, right? We don't really just see, we're taught to look. So, um, so, so when we reread books, for example, or we watch stuff, we always look at captions, right? So we're always informed by, by the words that are attached to an idea. And, and so that's kind of inevitable. What's interesting, though, is that uh, I, I, I believe I subscribe to the idea that, that artifacts or things have a certain kind of persistence, a certain kind of, um, well, Gell calls it agency, right? Um, all kinds of ideas are, are used to talk about this kind of the thingness of things. So in that case, um, one could say that from the perspective, let's say, of testing an idea, the claims that are made about a thing could actually potentially be tested, right? Because you have the thing. So that's the nice aspect of it. So if you're gonna say, oh, this was, you know, came from that century, whatever, or this came from that part of the world, it's possible for us to ask it of a ask it, ask a question of the artifact itself. Hence changing the the things we say, right? Or changing the the kinds of ideas that we attach to it. Uh, so that's on the abstract level. But I think the other dimension you're, one, you're asking, I think, right, would be, uh, you know, identity claims, right? So if about the thingness of a thing, like that's ours and that's yours, that's from that part of the world, I would say it applies in the same way, right? There's a way for us to kind of ask the question of this and related class of objects um, that, will tell us so much. I hope that answers the question. I have a question from the audience from uh, Deborah Crone, who's a faculty member at the BGC. She asks, um, it seems like many of the collectors you mentioned in passing were women. Uh, and she notes this is often the case with textiles. Uh, is this true more generally in your research? And do you have a, a kind of a understanding of why this might be the case in the Philippines? Um, for the colonial material, it's actually not necessarily women. If I looked at colonial material as a whole, uh, numerically, a large part of the Smithsonian's, for example, has a lot of uh, donations from soldiers, right? Who have gone, come back. Um, and I only looked at the Mindanao material, but they come back from the field. And so numerically speaking, there's a lot of collecting. Um, soldiers like weapons, so there's a lot of weaponry, um, except we don't have a lot of information about exactly where they got it, right? It's, it's kind of not always unreliable. For textiles, um, I did uh, study um, the Metcalf sisters, but Faye Cooper Cole um, is, is, is a man, is, even though he's named Faye, right? And he was, although he was sent uh, by the Field Museum, um, so he's exact, I guess he's on his job, right? Not collecting on his own. Um, but Today, if I look at collectors, um, it seems that there's a great deal of interest by women um, to collect uh, textiles, but because they've also entered the antiquarian um, world. So there's also a great deal of interest um, as well from, from male collectors. Um, so, so I would say that my interest, of course, in the Metcalf sisters was because they were on their own, they were not anyone's agents, right? And they happen to be two females, and that whole story itself has has, a, has its own trajectory. Um, I did also study another collector, and he was a man. Um, I haven't published on his material because it's a little um, challenging because there was a lot of you might say kind of early twentieth century ethical issues uh, that, that that I need to address, and I feel like I need to publish it alongside somebody who comes from the 
community of origin because it's just so bombastic right so but but he was he was a he was a, a military person so so yes but not necessarily for the colonial material all right thank you <clears throat> i have another question from one of our ma students samuel snodgrass <clears throat> um, i'm curious how the banana fibers are processed from the plant without being spun is it just the nature of the plant or is there a more technical intervention that has to happen that's a great question i didn't uh, throw up my uh, my uh, banana fiber stripping slides, right? But essentially, it's a very low tech um, technique where they take the the petioles of the banana stem and they run it through a serrated blade and a tension frame. So anybody can set it up with just a little serrated blade and a tension frame, and you yank it, right? So the the stripping is is very straightforward. Um, the crucial thing is determining when to harvest because then that determines right the strength of uh, and, and the length of, of the fibers as well as the specific variety. Um, and yes, this is one of the things that a lot of textile people don't necessarily kind of believe that it's unspun. Um, I do know that there are some images I saw in the Yayama and uh, Okinawa and stuff where there was a spinning wheel. So I think there's a twist in some of the textiles, but some of the things I've looked at at the museum under ma uh, magnification actually are not um, twisted. Uh, there is no spin. Um, so the question then would just be end to end. So they just connect them end to end. Um, it's similar to silk. Silk is also unspun. Um, and so it's not only found in the Philippines because like I said, right, the banana fi fiber anywhere, whether or not there's ikat is, is pretty much uh, usable unspun. It's strong enough by itself. Uh, that's one of its beauties, which is why it's used today for security paper and all kinds of industrial applications. The other interesting thing uh, that this question reminds me of is that um, there's another category of cloth that the Philippines is famous for, pineapple cloth, piña, and that comes from pineapple fiber and it's pretty much processed from the plant similar to abaca. And it's very similar to abaca that it's not spun and it's similar to abaca that you basically knot, right, the fibers end to end to produce um, the thread. So it's all about knotting, right, of picking and knotting and then warping and all that. And it's important to think about the fact that the pineapple is introduced uh, into the Philippines. It's not endemic to the Philippines. It was introduced after Spanish colonialism. So from the point of view of, right, of the Visayans who, who are very, very good and specialized on pineapple fiber production, um, they took abaca techniques and applied it to pineapple to produce this beautiful diaphanous, right? Very, very thin cloth. Um, so yes, but that's, uh, thank you. That's a, that's a great question. I have just to say on abaca, I have a question from uh, Celine Kerfant. Thank you very much for your amazing talk. Is there ikat made of abaca in Indonesia or is it only found in the Philippines and the Ryukyu Islands? As far as I know, Celine, and that's a great question. No, I haven't found um, uh, a baka, you know, banana, right? So, so I'm very specific here. A baka, which means Musa Textilis and Ikat, I haven't found it in Indonesia. There is a lot of warp Ikat in Indonesia, as I mentioned before, that looks very similar to Bagoba cloth, but it's all cotton. The only non-cotton one that I have seen, which I'm so curious about, I was hoping to go to the museum and study it, would be Ulap Doyo which is a cloth by the Benwak people in Kalimantan, but they don't use um, a baka. It's a, a different kind of strand and they actually twist it. So it actually has a bit of a twist, right? But the work on that is by Liz Oli, um, but I'm only using her publication since I, you know, I haven't done any of the research there. So the answer would be no. I would love to know if there is. The only Indonesian banana material I found would be the Samihe Talaud um, material um, that I believe is in, Vienna, uh, they, they have it in Vienna, uh, where they have supplementary weft, right? So, but but ikat, no. So, if anyone finds it, let me know. <laughs> I would love to. Um, I would love to know more. So, I have I have a final question in our formal uh, part, since we'll have to stop at one fifteen for students and faculty to get to class. It's from uh, Matthew Webb in the audience, uh, and he writes, "I'm thinking of uh, Annette uh, Weiner's." foundational work on banana leaf bundles in the Trobrian Islands, highlighting the hidden dimensions of women's community exchange practices, and more generally social participation. In your thinking about language, textiles, and groupness, how do you factor in the question of communities of practice, which may come together for shorter or longer duration, 
distinctions and context-based distinction of group identity? Um, thank you. That's a great question. Yes, Annette Weiner's work is, is, is very important, so, so seminal. Um, it's a very complex uh, question because uh, there is a great deal of, of social forces, right, that, that um, as we speak, I, I'm actually part of a, of a group of folks uh, assessing the impact of Indigenous Peoples' Rights Act, right, on, on, on scholars, anthropologists working in the field, but also its impact on the communities, right, that, that anthropologists um, would like to study, including myself. Um, but, and so because of the, there, there's now an almost, I don't want to say intrusive, but there's now a kind of like a, a mediator where you have to go through, right, state um, authority, similar to some of the research in Indonesia where you have to have permits, right? Uh, but in this case, it's a little bit more um, involved, in which case I believe that in those kinds of contexts, um, women will disappear, right? They, 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 there will be a tendency for women's voices, women's knowledge, women's kind of, of viewpoints tend to not be foregrounded. That's just a pattern that I've observed. So that's one of the immediate impacts. But in answer to another part of that question, I actually looked at this specific idea and explored it um, in another paper I published about uh, the chiefly attire when indigenous peoples of the Philippines um, present themselves to the state in public fora. Uh, the men who are the leaders are wearing chiefly attire, so head cloths and, and garments. And, um, and those garments are actually made by women you cannot buy them in a store. You have to basically commission them from someone. Someone has to make them for you or give them to you. They're gifted or you make them on commission. And uh, women that make these cloths, the ones of a certain generation, as well as the men of a certain generation, were very clear about um, uh, earning the right to wear chiefly attire. Hence, as a chiefly, indigenous man, you need to earn the respect of a female for her to make it for you, right? So, so that was one of the things that, that um, kind of points to that question about, right, uh, the, the fact that you can't buy these things, right? They have to be made by someone. And that someone also has some kind of cultural notion, right, of, of, uh, of, of chiefliness that could withhold it from you, right? So that's kind of a, a way of, I guess, a community um, um, intervention and some kind of um, implicit use of power. Yeah, I hope that answered that question. There's one more question that's, oh, uh, sure. that's come in. And it's oh, actually right. um, someone who's, the person who's speaking on, uh, on Thursday. So it's Tuchikane Yasuko, and here's the question. Uh, do you have a plan to integrate the question of identities and indigenousness? regarding Okinawan textiles to your current research on Bogobo textiles. And if you will pursue this direction, is the fact that Okinawa was once an independent kingdom a challenge to the central periphery relation to the modern Japanese state? Um, thank you, that's a wonderful question. Um, yes, I do, uh, I do want to kind of study more, integrate, think about right, the Okinawan material. Uh, we don't have that case for the independent kingdom um, for the Bagobo, right? Although we have, for example, the Maguindanao in the Sulu um, state, but for the Bagobo, that wouldn't be equivalent, right? However, the Bagobo, I believe, is a good example of a supra-local kind of uh, identity, which I think is kind of like an incipient political formation, right? So I believe that's part of what's going on. What I do see in the immediate future is that the work that has been done on Okinawan um, identity, um, specifically uh, the work of, of, of Katrin Hendricks as well as Amanda Mayer Stinchikum, right, on Minge, right, the, the arts and crafts movement um, coming from the center, right, coming from, from uh, the capital, uh, Japan and Japan, Japaneseness. I think that I'd like to kind of explore that uh, because I believe that that it's not articulated, but I think that something similar is happening right in, in the Philippines, um, including um, this uh, National Traditional Artist Award that I'm actually, uh, you know, I, I actually um, know a little bit more about that because the woman I work with uh, was one of the awardees in 1998. So yes, so the notion that there is this kind of um, 
um, Orientalism, right? Uh, not necessarily uh, as destructive <laughs> in other contexts, but it still got that assumption of of uh, of an authenticity that I think is very interesting and has a lot that can be used to inform the Philippine case. Thank you. I think we've got, yep, okay. Um, that's it for questions. So uh, thanks very much. And um, we'll have some more opportunity to talk uh, in the future. Thank you. Thank you for the people who are still in the room <laughs> and uh, thank you for inviting me. Um, yes, yeah. it was a pleasure. <laughs> thank right. you. And thanks to all of our visitors. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Bye-bye.